Okay, so how is everyone today? Eh. <laughs> it's math class again, right? <laughs> okay. So last time uh, we were talking about quadratic uh, equations, and we're still talking about quadratic equations. So, for example, um, x squared, so I could say solve x squared minus 12x minus 21 is 0. So we've gone over two techniques to solve such um, oops, such equations. One of them is by factoring. That's one method. What's the other method? Complete the square. So because I made no um, requirement as to your method, you should always try the most expedient method first. So the most expedient method is just to see, well, can I just factor it? Well, can you? Can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 21 and whose sum is negative 12? No, nah, probably not off the top of your head. There aren't any integers that do it anyway. So if factoring won't work, then there's only one method left available to us, and that's completing the square. OK, so then let's do it. So recall that completing the square is this procedure where you say, OK, I'm going to take everything that has an x, and I'm going to make a group, because they're all going to the party. But negative 21, you don't have an x, so you're not going. Then <coughs> what we're going to do inside of the square parentheses is we're going to add 0. And the way we're going to add 0 is that we're going to add something and then subtract the same something. So what is it we're going to add and then subtract? Negative 12 over 2, but we need one more thing to do to it. Squared, right? So negative 12 over 2 is negative 6. And then you square negative 6 and you get what? Thirty six, right? So we're gonna add thirty six and then subtract thirty six. So for some reason we're gonna find this quite expedient. Now, just to remind you what that where that's coming from is that it's always something over two and and then squared. And the question is, is what is the something? So what goes in that numerator? It's always this number. And then you add that much and subtract that much. OK. Now. The reason for doing this is that <clears throat> inside of the square parentheses, the first three terms are themselves a square, which is to say, how can you factor these first three terms? So just those. x minus 6, all squared. So these three became this. Now we can deassociate, collect the constants together. Negative 36 minus 21 is negative 57. And then we can move uh, the 57 to the other side, and we get x minus 6 squared is 57. 
So that's moving the constant stuff to the to the other side. So any question about getting to that position? Okay. <coughs> now, now that we are at this position, it, I'll ask the same thing that I've asked so many times now is, okay, I'm going to cover that up. Whatever I'm covering up is being squared. So my question is, the question is, what could I possibly reveal so that this equation is true? <coughs> yeah, square root of 57. Because if, you know, if I, if I, if I peek, peek under there and then I see a, a square root of 57, then we'd square it and get 57, which is equal to 57, so it would be true. The, then the other thing that could be in there is negative square root of 57, because squaring um, squashes the, ne the negation. So what I was covering up was x minus 6, so then it must be the case that x minus 6 is negative square root 57, or x minus 6 is square root 57. Now, my experience tells me that about between a third and a half of you like to jump from here to here, and the remainder find this jump to be unpalatable. So now in this vertical space I left myself, I'm going to show you the, a different way to see the intermediate details. So we could have proceeded with radicals and said, OK, I'll compute the square root of both sides. <coughs> so that's computing the square root of both sides. But now you need to remember algebraically, what does the right-hand side is as good as it gets, square root 57. What becomes of the left-hand side? That is to say, how does the square root interact with the square? becomes absolute value. So most students write this. Most students write that. But that's not right. Rather, like so. And then I could ask the same question again, which is to say, I'm covering up something which is inside of absolute value. What could I possibly reveal so that this equation is true? square root of 57 or negative square root of 57. So one way or another, either from here the equation splits or from here the equation splits, the equation splits into these two. And then the answer is x is 6 minus the square root of 57 or <coughs> x is 6 plus the square root of 57. And so now back at the, <laughs> the top, when, when we said, well, can this be done the easy way? Are there two numbers whose product is negative 21 and whose sum is negative 12 that you can think of? Well, no, because that's what they look like, right? <laughs> Who could have thought of that off the top of their head, right? OK. Any question about this? So now, um, have a look at this particular quadratic. And I would like for you to note that, in particular, the quadratic in this exercise is monic. What does that mean? Its leading coefficient is 1. And if you go back in the notes and look at all of the times that we've completed the square, you will, you will find that all of those examples have been monic. And so now I'm telling you that I've been keeping you inside of a, a safe space, right? A walled garden of monic, monicness. So now we're going to see, well, what would happen if, if the quadratic was not monic? How would we proceed? And the answer is we'll have to do something just slightly different.
Okay. <clears throat> so here's such an example. Solve 3x squared minus 24x mm, minus 10 equal to 0. So again, I've made no um, I've made no requirement as to how you solve this. And that means that you still have two techniques available to you. You have the factoring technique and you have completing the square. So as for the factoring technique, because this polynomial is not monic, its leading coefficient is 3, we're looking for two numbers whose product is blank and whose sum is blank. So what do we want the product to be? Negative 30, right? 3 times negative 10. And what do we want the sum to be? Negative 24. So can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 30 and whose sum is negative 24? There aren't any integers which do it. So I guess we can't do the factoring thing. And if not the factoring thing, then what is left open to us? <laughs> completing the square, right? So does everybody see? Okay, I get it. Com we have to complete the square. Okay. Well, it begins in the same way that it's always it always has begun. So we're going to collect everything with x together and exclude everything without x. Negative 10, you don't get to go to the party. Uh, however, now, now, we're, we're facing an issue, and that is the fact that this is not monic. And we have to deal with that. So the way we're going to deal with it is, well, exactly, this, exactly in the only way that you could, is let's, let's factor out that 3. So my question to you is, what would go inside of the square parentheses if we were to factor out the 3? x squared minus 8x. x squared minus 8x. And you can check that, because if you were to distribute the 3 back in, you get 3x squared minus 24. And now, notably, what notable thing does the polynomial inside of the square parentheses have? It is what? Monic. It's monic. Ah, now we can deal with it, right? So do you observe that because we factored out this 3, that made it monic? And now, yes? So, uh, maybe you're asking, why didn't I divide this whole equation by 3 in the first place? So, in principle, that would work. However, we're going to do a technique very similar to this in about 2 or 3 weeks, and you would not be able to do something like that. So, I am trying to exercise economy of technique. Uh, so, inside of the square parentheses, we want to add something and subtract the same something. What do we want to add and subtract? 8 over 2 squared. Which is? 16. So we're going to add 16 and then subtract 16. And that has to occur inside of the parentheses. And then now, the first three terms inside of the square parentheses are themselves a square. So what are these first three terms when factored? X minus 4 squared. Mm -hmm. X minus 4 squared. And then minus 16. Minus 10. 
And now, now we distribute the three back in. And obtain three times x minus four squared minus 48 minus 10 is zero. So that three times x minus four squared is 58. So that x minus four squared is 58 over three. So now I'd like for you to observe that this is really the same position we, we always land in. The only difference, the only difference is that now the right hand side happens to be a fraction. And you may not, you may not particularly like fractions, but it makes no difference mathematically. Which is to say, I'm covering up something that is to be squared. What could I possibly reveal that could make this equation true? Mm -hmm. The square root of that thing or the negation of the square root of that thing. Okay. So then x is 4 minus the square root of 58 over 3, or x is 4 plus the square root of 58 over 3. So back to the top, when we asked, can we think of two numbers whose product is um, negative 30 and whose sum is negative 24? Well, the answer is uh, no, because in the end, the numbers have the, the way the numbers are expressed look like this. Uh, there's another factor floating around, but more or less, they look like this. <laughs> All those radicals and fractions floating around. No, I can't think of two numbers that do that. <laughs> OK. So now I'd like to make an observation. Uh, the first one is that, wow, isn't this really boring? <laughs> Yeah, this is a really boring procedure, to be honest with you. It's, it's, it's always the same, and, and part of the boringness of it, part of the boringness of it is it's literally the same thing over and over again. Right? If we go back to the Monic case, right, we could do this in that much space over and over again, like for a different value. Like maybe I change this negative 12 to neg negative 16. And then instead of adding 36 and subtracting 36, we we'd add 64 and subtract 64 and then we'd do something slightly different but really the same so the sameness of all of this culminates in the following is that let's take all those numbers and just call give them names let's say a is the first number, B is the second, and C is the third. So say they're all in the reals, and A is not zero. And what we're considering is the equation AX squared plus BX plus C equal to zero. So that represents every conceivable quadratic equation. All quadratic equations fit this pattern. So this is the general form of a quadratic equation. Now, if we take this and then 
factor out the a, and then do b over 2 squared so that we'd have b squared over 4, and then add b squared over 4 and subtract b squared over 4, and then do a whole bunch of other <coughs> crazy algebra gymnastics to complete the square. So if we were to complete the square on this, then we would arrive at the following. We could solve for x and determine that x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac and then divide all of these things by 2a. So what I'm telling you is that if, if we took that a, b, and c and we just dealt with them symbolically and completed the square and solved for x, we would come to this. And the name of this is the quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. <clears throat> OK. So now, this is called a quadratic equation. It is something that you could, in principle, solve. And then if you were to solve it, these would be the solutions. So this one is called an, a quadratic equation, and this one is called a quadratic formula. It's the one that tells you the solutions. Now, where a mathematician is concerned, there's a very distinct difference between an equation and a formula. However, my experience tells me that most of you, maybe not most, but a large percentage of you are likely to mix these up and say, and say I don't know, I'm just going to call them both the quadratic equation or whatever. Okay, so I don't care. We're not going to count off for that. But you should know that this one is the quadratic equation and that one is the its solutions and it's called the formula. Okay. So, um, let's use it. So suppose I give you... Uh, this exercise. Solve x squared minus 12x plus 35 equal to 0. And I'd like to point out that I've given no um, I've given no requirement as to the method, which means that you should use the most expedient method possible. What's most expedient here? Factoring, I think, right? Can you think of two numbers whose product is <coughs> positive 35 and whose sum is negative 12? Huh? So x minus 5, x minus 7, so that quadratic factors. And I think we can all be comfortable if I just say, well, therefore the solutions are 5 and 7. So now suppose that I say that that's 1, and then 2, I say, okay, now I want you to solve with the quadratic formula. So now, now it's not up to you. Now I want you to use the quadratic formula. However, we, we solved this and obtained 5 and 7. And if the quadratic formula is correct, then it, it too should be able to pick out 5 and 7, right? <laughs> okay, so what are, what are A, B, and C in this exercise? What are the values of A, B, and C? Is one. Yes. Yes. Very good. So now, are there any questions why on this specific exercise for that specific quadratic, those are the values of A, B, and C? This is okay. So then from there, it's just a matter of plugging things in. So negative, negative 12, plus or minus the square root of negative 12 squared minus 4 times
times 1 times 35, and then divide all of this by 2 times 1. And wow, that's a mouthful <laughs> of arithmetic, isn't it? And we'll do it, but before we do it, is there any question why, why these A, B, and C have substituted into the formula just so? This is okay. So then, well, negative, negative 12, that's 12. And then plus or minus the square root of negative 12 squared is 144. And then 4 times 1 is 4 times 35 is... 140, and then all of this is going to be over 2, and then x, that would be 12 plus or minus the square root of 4 over 2. Well, the square root of 4 is 2, so this is 12 plus or minus 2, and then divide all of this by 2. Now understand the meaning of this notation. This notation is signifying two different things. It's saying that one of the possibilities is when we take the plus or minus to be a minus. The other possibility is when we take the plus or minus to be a plus, which is to say this is saying 12 minus 2 and then divide all this by 2 or 12 plus 2 and divide all this by 2. Well, what's 12 minus 2? 10, and then divide that by 2 is 5, right? And then 12 plus 2 is 14, and divide that by 2 is 7. So, was the quadratic formula able to pick out the right solutions? Yes, but I think we can all agree that it was a little convoluted getting there, which is what I mean when I say if I, if I ask you to do something and you have multiple methods available to you and I, and I make no request as to the specific method, <coughs> by all means choose the most expedient method. Right. <laughs> Okay, now, so there's the, the quadratic formula. And this is the most complicated formula in uh, college algebra. None of them are, th this is maximal complication right here. And it may be the most complicated formula that, that you have had to memorize anyway. And you must memorize it for this class. It will not be provided, but it is expected that you know it. So to ease your concern that you might not be able to memorize it, I'll let you know that I have, I have two children who are both old, older than three now, but when each of them was three, they knew the quadratic formula. And by that I mean they could say it out loud. I don't, I don't claim at all that they had any idea the significance of what they were saying, but they could say it. Because <clears throat> the quadratic formula can be sung to the tune of Frere Jacques. Negative b plus or minus the square root, the square root of b squared minus 4ac, of b squared minus 4ac, all over 2a, all over 2a. <laughs> it's pretty good, huh? <laughs> So it can be sung to other tunes too. For example, Pop Goes the Weasel. But I'll spare you the, the details. Now, uh, in fact, if you just do a quick YouTube search of quadratic formula song, you'll get lots and lots of hits. Okay. So now, that's probably unexpected. Didn't see it coming that I was gonna sing <laughs> the quadratic formula. And you might think it a bit silly, but Here's, here are the facts. It's Wednesday. In 14 days, there will be a quiz open. And the quadratic formula will be 
among the topics on the quiz. And you'll be taking it in the testing center. No and, there, in and there's no singing in there. But if you listen real close, one of your colleagues might be in there, and you might just hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it all comes flooding back, then I have succeeded, right? <laughs> I, I, then I won. <laughs> so good. So any question about this? <clears throat> okay. So maybe one more of these. Um, no, wait. Did, did we do one? No, wait. Yeah, okay. So how about, um, about 2, I want you to solve 2x squared minus uh, 12x uh, minus Seven is equal to zero. I was running the the numbers in my head, making sure I didn't make a bad choice. So, again, I've made no requirement as to the method to solve this. So, at 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 present, we have three possibilities open to us. One of them is factoring, and the most straightforward of all of these is factoring. So can we easily factor this sort of directly? We'd be looking for two numbers whose product is blah and whose sum is blah, other blah. So what, what do we want the product to be? Negative 14. What do we want the sum to be? Negative 12. So can you think of two numbers whose product is negative 14 and whose sum is negative 12? There aren't any integers which do it. So uh, I guess we're not going to use the factoring method. OK, so then let's use the quadratic formula. What specific values of a, b, and c are we going to use? Two, negative twelve, negative seven. Is there any question why those are the A, B, and C values? Then from here, it's just a matter of arithmetic. So negative negative twelve plus or minus the square root of negative twelve squared minus four times two times negative seven. All of that divided by 2 times 2. So then that would be 12 plus or minus the square root of, well, this sounds like a job for a calculator. It's 200. Really? Okay. And then divide by 4. So I'm not interested in you simplifying radicals. We did that at the beginning of the semester, but that is kind of uninteresting to me anyway. So there's two possibilities. What are the two possible solutions? They, they just correspond to this symbol can be can be construed in two ways once as being a, a, a subtraction and once as being an addition so 12 minus square root 200 divided by 4 what's the other possibility did I, did I make an error I'm getting a lot of silence here <laughs>
question about this. So, answers like that are, in a sense, the reason why you can't think of two numbers whose product is negative 14 and whose sum is negative 12. Because <coughs> they're related to those numbers. <laughs> okay. So you wouldn't want us to simplify square root of 200? No. If you were just really interested in doing so, then 100 is, yeah, you yes. could still do it. 100 is in there, so a 10 could come out, but a 2 would be left inside the radical, etc. I just, I don't, I don't find that interesting. Feel free to do it. Okay, so now, here's the quadratic formula. And we've used it a couple times here. For example, we used it here. And the thing under the radical on this specific example turned out to be 4. Okay, on the, on the other one, it turned out to be 200. Now, what if, what if we were to do a quadratic, and this bit under the, quadratic, under the radical happened to be, say, negative 17? Then what? That'd be a real problem, wouldn't it? Because remember, quadratic, or square root, is a radical, even radical. It's radical 2. And remember, we've talked about the parity of radicals. What's true about, about radicals of even parity? Yeah, you can't, you can't plug in negative things. So if it were to happen that b squared minus 4ac were negative, that would mean you couldn't use this formula. It would mean that there's no solutions. What if b squared minus 4ac was equal to 0, which is to say, the thing I'm covering up, what if it were 0? Well, what is the square root of 0? Zero? 0. So if b squared minus 4ac were 0, that would be just like that's not even there. And in that case, the <coughs> quadratic formula would not be giving you two solutions. It'd be giving you just one, negative b over 2a. You'd just get one. So here's a case where you get two solutions. If b squared minus 4ac is 0, you get just one. And if b squared minus 4ac is negative, you don't get any. That's interesting. So now, let's try and understand why that must be the case. So in order to understand why it must be the case, we'll take a brief detour, and we're going to consider y is x squared. We're going to make a brief table of values. So we're going to fill out that table, and then we're going to plot what we get. So, negative 3 squared, well that's 9. And then 4, then 1, then 0, and then 1, then 4, then 9. So notice that the red values, that is to say the y values, read the same forward and backwards. And last time we noted a different table for a different thing that read the same forward and backwards. What was the other thing? It wasn't y is x squared, it was what? <coughs> Do you recall? Last time we made a table and it read the same forward and backwards? Absolute value. Absolute value. Yeah, well, so, okay, <laughs> yeah, this one, I'm, parabola, I've never heard that before. <laughs> so, the fact that these 
The fact that these read the, the same forward and backwards means that just like absolute value, when you, when you draw it, you'll see a symmetry. A symmetry will be present. So let's plot these. So we get 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and then 3, 9 is already off the, off the scale. And then we get this one, and we get that one, and then the other one is off the scale. But what I want you to notice is that these points come in pairs, right? Symmetric, that's the fours. Symmetric, that's the ones. And then there's the zero. And here we plotted five points, but if we took a lot of time and plotted five million points, then it might look like this. So you can see it's symmetric in the same kind of way that absolute value is symmetric, except this is bendy, right? This is curved, whereas the, the left and right side of the absolute value are straight. So this particular shape is so common and is, and is so important in math and science that it does have its own name. What is the name of this shape? Parabola. Parabola. That's a big R. <laughs> That's fine. So parabola. <clears throat> uh, now, the thing is, is that every quadratic, we've been talking about them purely algebraically, but every quadratic, when you, when you were, if you were to draw it, has a shape like this. So, so when you think algebraically quadratic, geometrically, in your mind, associate to that parabola, a shape like that. So now, <coughs> again, let A, B, and C be in the reals with A not 0. And we can consider AX squared plus BX plus C equal to 0. And when we complete the square, we obtain the quadratic formula negative b plus or minus square root and now we're going to be concerned with the thing under the radical so I'm going to draw it in red b squared minus 4 a c so we're interested in that part <coughs> The thing under the radical is so significant that it has its own name. It is called the discriminant. Discriminant. And it is denoted with capital D. Just like we were talking about on the previous page, there are three possibilities. One possibility is that the discriminant is positive. If the discriminant is positive, for example, on the previous page, we had determined that the discriminant was 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. So one of the possibilities is when we subtracted 2, and the other possibility is when we added 2. Well, that means that with a positive discriminant, the number of real solutions is 2, corresponding to the two possibilities. Now I'm going to draw a picture for you. I'm going to draw a parabola. And I'm going to draw a horizontal line. And now my question is going to be, please tell me the number of intersections. So how many intersections are there? Two. Here and here. So. Algebraically, if you're dealing with a quadratic, 
that has a positive discriminant, then geometrically you're dealing, in the end, with a situation like this, a parabola that has a line intersecting it in two places. Now, I hope that you're getting deja vu about when we were talking about absolute value. So now I'm going to grab this green line. And if I could wiggle it a little bit, and you could see the blue arrows pointing at the intersections, they would wiggle too. So as long as I leave it up here, there's always going to be two intersections. But what if I grab it, and I pull it down, 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 down to here? Then those two blue arrows will now be pointing at the same place. There'll just be one place now. There'll be one intersection. That corresponds to the case when the discriminant is zero. And in this case, the number of real solutions is one. And the drawing looks like this. Just one. Now who can predict what I'm going to say next? <laughs> so what's the last algebraic possibility? That the discriminant is what? Less than zero. So when the discriminant is negative, <coughs> what's the number of real solutions? None. Zero. Because what, I, what we're asking is, is, well, if this redness, if this red bit was negative, you wouldn't be able to do this. So there wouldn't be any solutions if the red was negative. And the picture is, well, now I started with the green line here, and then I pulled it down to there. And now I pull it down further. To where the number of intersections is zero. OK. So the discriminant informs you about the number of solutions you're going to get. So let's have such an exercise in the last closing moments here. So for example, I could say consider the following equation. 3x squared <coughs> plus 2x plus 8 equal to 0. And I could ask, first question, I could say, please compute the discriminant. And then, please compute the number of real solutions. And once you have done that, of these possibilities, I want you to tell me which is the most reasonable. Now, on this exercise, I'd like to point out, I'm asking three things, but there is something that I am notably not asking. What am I notably not asking? I'm not asking you to factor it, but even, <coughs> even something more. I'm not even asking you to solve it. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not even asking you to solve this, this equation. So the discriminant, the formula is b squared minus 4ac. And then on this specific exercise, that would be <coughs> 2 squared minus 4 times 3 times 8. 
So, typing that into the calculator, that would be negative 92. Okay, so the discriminant is negative 92. What does this tell us about the number of solutions? There are none. Algebraically, if you like, because you can't put negative things inside of even radicals. So there's zero. And then as a result of that, which one of these pictures is the most reasonable picture? This one. <coughs> because they're not intersecting. Now, the last thing I want to say is this. I didn't ask you to solve it. So a particular exercise where students can go astray is that I could put like five quadratic equations on the same page and say, for each of these, I want you to compute the discriminant and the number of solutions. And if you read the instructions, it's not a big deal. I'm asking you to evaluate b squared minus 4ac five times. You can do that with a calculator. But the way students go wrong is they attempt to go ahead and solve five quadratic equations on a single sheet of paper and they turn into me a solid sheet of graphite. That's what it looks like, <laughs> okay? And it's usually wrong. <laughs> so please don't, please don't do that. Please read the instructions carefully. Have a nice Wednesday. <laughs>